Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Our guest in this edition is Dakota Meyer. He is a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps and served in both Iraq and Afghanistan. While in Afghanistan in 2009, he disobeyed orders in an effort to rescue his fellow Marines who had come under deadly fire. His heroism that day led to Meyer receiving the Medal of Honor. I had the honor of interviewing Dakota Meyer at an American Veterans Center conference in Washington. And we began by discussing where he grew up and how he came to join the service. Well, I was, um, I was raised in Columbia, Kentucky. Uh, it's a little small town in uh, south central Kentucky. So I lived on a farm with my father and, you know, went to high school. And uh, I graduated high school in a place called Greensburg, Kentucky. And, you know, grew up there my whole life. And when did you join the service? I joined the service on June 18, 2006. Um, I had never really thought about going to the Marine Corps, never really you know, took the military as a consideration. It was just really a, a, a winged decision. I uh, was walking through the back of my classroom, and there was a Marine recruiter, or not the classroom, but back of my lunchroom, and there was a Marine recruiter sitting back there in his dress blues, and I went up to him and was kind of being a smart aleck and stuff like that to him and basically he said uh, I, I he said what are you going to do when you get out of high school he took it for a little bit and then he said that and I said well I'm going to go play football somewhere hopefully and he said well that's what I do too because you never make it in the Marine Corps you know so I walked off and then came back a few minutes later and talked him into picking his stuff up and I signed up that day what was it I, you it- know it's just a challenge it's a challenge and I think that's what a lot of uh, you know a lot of our veterans uh, it's about the challenge. It's about wanting to be more and to be a greater person and to, to go and do more and do stuff, service for their country. And you know, But me, I didn't understand that part of it at first. It was just the challenge in the initial beginning. And once you signed up, where did you go? Went to Paris Island. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful place. It's a really, really nice, nice place to go for a uh, you know, vacation. <laughs> um, so I went to Paris <laughs> Island. After there, I went to Camp Geiger, North Carolina to do inf- go through infantry training. And then after infantry training, I went down to, um, I was stationed in Hawaii for the next four years. Talk about Paris Island a little bit. How much did that change you? Uh, you know, it's, it's crazy. You know, looking looking back, you know, I thought I never thought I'd make it through Paris Island. It was, at the time, it was the hardest thing that I ever went through. But then when I look at everything across the board inside the military over the four years, it was the easiest. So it's, um, you know, it's kind of crazy at the time, you know, it's, an example of you know the storm that's in front of you is always the biggest and then when you look back it's not necessarily the the big storm it's just a little shower did you find yourself instinctively falling back on that training <clears throat> you know, I, I think that it, a lot of it made sense you know a lot of the stuff that you thought was dumb and you could never make sense of it really started to make sense of you know why to pay attention you know why to the attention to detail is so important and why everything you know they try to build everything you do in the marine corps you know everything you do in your everyday life that'll help you in combat down the road and then when did you enter combat or when did you get deployed uh you know my first deployment was in uh july of 2007 i left for iraq so Went over to Fallujah in 2007. I was there for about 45 to 60 days and I uh, got sent home early. I was bit on my right hand by a spider and lost a lot of nerves and feelings in it. Had two surgeries in uh, Iraq and then came back to Germany for a while and then came home to, to rehab my hand. And the rehab was successful? Yeah, yeah, it works now. <laughs> and so when did you head to Afghanistan? So I trained up for another couple years. Uh, got, I t- took over as a sniper team, became a sniper team leader. Went to a couple more schools, and we were headed back to Iraq. And in 2009, when a, we were actually in 29 Palms doing our final training, and a gunnery sergeant came up and said, we need five volunteers to go to Afghanistan. And so I raised my hand, and luckily I got selected, so I left for Afghanistan. I left to go join my new team right after that immediately, and then I left for Afghanistan in July of 2009. Why'd your hand go up? Yeah, I, it was just, you know, because basically at Iraq I felt like was over, like the, the fight was done, and I really wanted to go get in a gunfight. I really wanted to go do my job, and I really wanted to, you know, I wanted, I wanted the challenge of being in a fight. I wanted to, you know, and I always wanted to go to Afghanistan because, you know, <clears throat> Afghanistan is a 
it's a uh, it's it's significant in in the day that wrecked our country on you know September 11, 2001. Mm-hmm. And so, what unit were you with when you went over there? Uh, I was with the Fourth Marine Division. I was uh, I was transferred out of my team to Fourth Marine or my unit, which was Third Battalion, Third Marines. I was transferred to Fourth Marine Division in Okinawa, Japan, and I went back over with an advisor team um, to TAC-8. And what part of the country were you in? I was in a place called, in northeastern Afghanistan, in a place called the Kunar Province. It was the top of the Kunar Province at a, at a place called Asmar. Um, so, you know, it was, we were up northeast. It was different than where a lot of Marines were. We were in the, in the Army area of operations. And you're part of the sniper team. What was your job day to day? Well, that's actually another part of it is, you know, I left my sniper team to go to this. I, was, I actually was an advisor to the Afghan National Army, so we lived on a base of four U.S. and 80 Afghans uh, in, our, in our small little base, and we trained, and our job was to advise them and help, help train and transition them to be able to take over their country, and we trained them on everything from logistics to, uh, you know, to weapons training to... Uh, you know, fire support. I mean, everything that we're taught on, we try to teach them and help them build their own um, their own stability, so that they can, you know, eventually, like we're doing now, let them take over their own country and still hold it. For those who weren't there, especially as both wars were going on, Iraq and Afghanistan, they're kind of almost used interchangeably. But when we talk to folks who've been there, they say it really couldn't have been more different. Since you were in both places, how would you? What would you say are the biggest differences, both in dealing with the people and dealing with the terrain and everything? Well, I mean, you know, so we start with the terrain. I mean, you know, Iraq, we, we kind of had it secured in, in about 2007 because the terrain wasn't near as treacherous as Afghanistan. You know, you could contain Iraq by, you know, because the terrain would let you. A- Afghanistan, the terrain wouldn't let you. I mean, the terrain is insane. It's It's a lot bigger. Um, you know what I mean? So it's uh, a lot of people don't understand how big Afghanistan is. Afghanistan is huge. And um, so, you know, with that being said, that's one issue. Uh, the second difference is, is the people. I mean, you know, if you put Afghanistan against Iraq, Afghanistan would beat Iraq all day long. I mm-hmm. mean, the, the fighters were uh, ten times better. I mean, uh, it wasn't even comparable. The, you know, if you take a look at 2007 when we did the surge into Iraq, you know, it's like a water faucet just shut off. The fighting just stopped, kind of. You know what I mean? They, they, they basically said, okay, we give, right? Well, when you look at the surge we did in Afghanistan in 2009, 2010 time frame, I mean, the, it, that's the bloodiest time of, the, of that war. I mean, you look at Sang and you look at, I mean, you look at these stories of, of the history of these Marines and, and soldiers pushing through in these battles. And, you know, and that just shows you the fight of these, these, these men and women who are over there that, that, that have these, these radical beliefs. So definitely, definitely you're fighting. It, I, I, would, I guess I would put it in comparison of fighting in Afghanistan and fighting Iraq. Fighting Afghanistan is like fighting a pro team versus fighting in Iraq is kind of like, um, they're, they're kind of like the, I would put them as a little league team almost. Maybe, maybe, maybe put them up there at high school. You know what I mean? If wow. you're comparing them, I mean it's just. But you look at Iraq; they've been fighting their whole life. Or Afghanistan; they've been fighting. I mean, they, you talk to the ones that fought the Russians. You talk, you know. So, but I mean, you know, so that, this is just my perspective in talking to people and people who've been to it. I didn't see a lot of combat in Iraq, so I, you know, I, I can't really. I'm just saying the difference in people and their, their willingness to fight. What did you sense from the Afghan soldiers you were trying to train? Did it come easily to them? Was it difficult? <clears throat> well, I mean, look, the thing that you got to, you know, you got to put in perspective, you're, you know, us as Americans, you know, trying to look at them, we're trying to compare apples to oranges, you know what I mean? Uh, so that's the first start of it. Now, fighting, I mean, these, these people have been fighting their whole life, so obviously they're a lot better at fighting. They just don't have the technology we do. As far as the heart, they've got the heart, uh, from my perspective. Um, I tell you, I mean, the Afghans I are with, I, I, I truly believe that I am alive today because the Afghan soldiers that I had next to me. In just a moment, Dakota Meyer will take us to that horrible day in 2009 where he tried desperately and valiantly to save the lives of Marines hit by deadly enemy fire. This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. 
Next up in my interview with Medal of Honor recipient Dakota Meyer, I asked him to recount the events of September 8, 2009, as his fellow Marines came under heavy fire, and Meyer's actions that day would lead to him receiving the nation's highest award for valor. Well, um, it's actually, a, you know, it starts a whole week. So we had um, on Sunday, September 6th, we had, uh, it, that's, it seems like that was the day that, that everything started getting bad. We took, a, we took, I don't know, 12, 14 rockets, 107 rockets directly to our base, lost a guy, um, I had a guy in, in, in the, in, up uh, with me, had his leg cut off, the rocket hit. I mean, it was it, it just like seemed like from that day on that everything just went downhill. Uh, hadn't seen a lot of combat at that point. I took that rocket, Kinefic and my my uh, uh, Gunny Kinefic and Doc Layton got blown up by a rocket that day too. Received Purple Hearts, and then after that fight was over with, it lasted for a while. You know, we uh, the team went back and we set and we talked about it and just, you know, kind of, it's kind of like the realization of, whoa, this, this was, this was the worst one yet. And, um, you know, we were told, hey, you know, you're going to come down and, and go to, we need you to, we're going to run a mission and we need y'all to come down tonight. So we had actually packed up that night and we were going to run it Monday. Well, then we got told, called back and said, no, we're going to run it on Tuesday, which was the 8th. So that was whenever the mission had got pushed right. Uh, one day, so we went down there the next day, got briefed that night, and uh, on what the mission was, I wasn't I wasn't happy with it. I wasn't comfortable with it. I seen some flaws in it that could be crucial flaws, and brought it up. I mean, there's a lot of arguing in the team about it, and finally, you know, I was basically told I was basically told, you know, you're an E4 in the United States Marine Corps. You know, what do you know about mission planning? So. You know, and what's so crazy is everybody thinks that, that, you know, we came up with this plan to go in and do what we did, but we came up with it the night before because we thought that the, the mission was planned so bad. What was it about this plan, Dakota, that had you so concerned? Uh, you know, I was concerned about the, uh, the, communica- the comm plan, the communications plan of how many people on a, on a radio uh, we were having to go through. Snipers are on top of a hill, so you're having to do a relay. You've got more than one moving element trying to go through that relay it really doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so that was one, not direct air on station. Um, that was number two. Uh, and leaving the vehicles behind was number three. I didn't see any need in it. But but I was told that that we wanted to be clandestine with the 90-man patrol, you know, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense in either way. But uh, e- either way, I... Um, you know, so I, we we were going in that morning. We left at three to three thirty in the morning. Going in, um, myself and Staff Sergeant Rodriguez Chavez were left back at the vehicles. They, uh, the team, everybody left and started patrolling into the village. Started seeing people. Uh, I could see them through the thermals going up into the mountains. And called it out over the radio. And basically, I was told to get off the radio. Um, they kept going in. Once they got in there, it, you know, it just it just started. The lights shut off in the village, and it just like it was like all hell broke loose. Just, um, I mean, it was bad. So, you know, but at first, you know, it's it's always chaotic. They usually they usually try to throw you the whole kabang at you, you know, at first, and then they and then they uh, and then it slows down. You know what I mean? But it just this it didn't seem like it did. I don't know where they got all their ammo from, but I mean, it just kept coming and coming and coming. Um, so after after a while, myself, Staff Sergeant Rodriguez Chavez, I started requesting permission to go in. And each time, I was, we were told no. And finally, we just said we're going. And you know, because that's really what brothers do for one another. And so we decided to go in. And it took us three or four trips to get in. And, you know, at, when we finally got in there. I mean, there was just people everywhere. I mean, there was Afghans that were wounded. I mean, it was just, it was it was like you could have never imagined how bad the scene was. And then, um, so, you know, for about six to eight, eight hours, six, six, six to eight hours, I don't know, four to six hours, I kept looking for my teammates, but I couldn't find them, you know. And as we're driving in the first time, I hear, um, I hear them come over the radio, and they uh, were calling in a support artillery mission, and they were denied. And 
they said it's too close to the village and he said if you if you don't give me these rounds right now we're going to die and they said we'll try your best and so at that point I knew the severity of the situation and and so we uh, heard Kenefit come over the radio he started calling in for a medical evacuation so obviously someone's hurt and as he started to call it in you know he only gave three or four numbers and stopped and that was the last time I ever heard from my team and so after we got in there uh, it took us about six hours we were pulling out bodies and sending them back out and trying to save what we could and finally a helicopter spotted their bodies in a trench um, to, to my I think it's to my to, I don't know, so anyways, it was on the right-hand side of the road, so I got out, ran over and got them, we pulled them out, and then brought them home, so. Well, let's dive into this just a little bit more. Um, how close were you before you decided to disobey orders, essentially, and, and go in and, and assist probably, your men? How close were you to the action? Probably about 1,500 meters. I, I don't know. No, it's probably a mile. mile. Yeah, probably a mile away but you could see the village we were up on a higher spot you could see it i mean the chaos in there so you got a bird's eye view of what was yeah. going on down there yeah and so how did you enter in you had trucks with a gun on it correct yeah, yeah. truck with the humvee with the up gun uh the first time we went in i had a 240 machine gun alongside a well so i had my base gun was a uh um, a mark knight i see yeah it was a mark 19 um mark 19 ended up jamming so we switched and i got into a a 50 cal, um, so went in 50 cal, uh, had a 240 uh, on my side, and then I also had my M4 203 grenade launcher uh, with me. And I know you made several different trips into there. On the first trip, what was your goal and what were you able to accomplish? I just wanted to get my teammates the whole time. There's only one objective I had that whole day, and that was to find my teammates and get them out alive. And on the first trip, what were you able to accomplish? You know, it's it's hard for me to remember each trip. I mean, mm -hmm. but you know, uh, I think the first main trip that went in, you know, we we pulled out. We met a bunch of the Afghans, and they jumped in the truck, and we took them out. Um, so we I got out and helped load some of them up. They were wounded, hurt. I mean, I mean, it was everybody was just you know they were exhausted. They were on uh, they were on uh, Ramadan during Ramadan, so they weren't eating or drinking. They wouldn't drink water. You know, I mean, it was craziness. I mean, it's like everything you could go wrong did. So the first trip got them out, and then uh, now that we didn't actually hit all the way in the valley at that point. Now the first full time in the valley, um, I mean, it was just all chaos. I mean, it was like the whole valley turned on the truck that we were in, and uh, so we just kept pulling bodies out, out, and that's what we did the whole time we went in. We had the Afghans pull their pickup trucks behind us, and we load. I'd load the, uh, put the dead on the bottom, and then I would put the guys who didn't look like they were going to make it. I'd try to put them, you know, up a little bit just in case we could save them. I'd try to do what I could, and then the ones who were going to live, we'd set them on top, and and let the, and try to we'd feel just fill in the back of the trucks up. Give us a little bit of a picture of what the surroundings are like. You mentioned that from where you started, you had the high ground. By the yeah. time you were down, or, or where the bodies were, did you still have the high ground? No, I mean, it was still like a bowl. I mean, it was like this village. It's like you picture a horseshoe of mountains around you. You're driving in, and, and it's like stair-stepped all the way up the village. Like It's like terraces everywhere. They're, you know, from 50 to uh, 50 to 75 meters long were wide, and then it goes up, you know, a three to four foot stair step, or a uh, four to five to six foot stair step. And it keeps going back, and um, you know, I mean, this place was like it was like it built to fight from, and, and you coming in was not the position. It wasn't built to fight in that way. It was built to, to keep people like us out, and uh, so you know, you got surrounding all around. You're taking you're taking uh, fire all around you. I mean, it, it was it was it was definitely the worst place you could be. So you had no defilade at any point while no, you were there. No, you had no defilade. Wow. You couldn't get. I mean. You try to get it behind a rock when you could, but I mean, there's not, you know, somebody's always got you, you know. They, if they're shooting off the mountain, I mean, they were shooting, they had such good angle on the mountain that, you know, you've got a turret around you inside the Humvee, but the bullets are hitting inside the turret. You mentioned how the Afghan soldiers, some were wounded, some were weakened due to Ramadan, but some were still able to help you, correct? Yes. 
and what were they doing at this time? They were, I mean, they were right there with me. You know, I'd take my interpreter, um, Fazel. You know, he'd been shot twice at this time, and um, I asked him if he would go back in with me. And I said I just need help finding my teammates, and he said, you know, today's my day to die. Today's my day to die, and stood right there with me and fought the whole time back in. How many did you have with you total? Do you think? Um, it just depended. Some of them were driving, some of them were going in and out. I mean, usually about five to six. So you were vastly outnumbered. Oh, yeah. We were outnumbered the whole time. Did you get good looks at them? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of them were pretty close. And so how, so you were inflicting pretty significant casualties on them? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's so hard to tell over there because, I mean, you know, it, you know, it's not like in the movies. You don't You don't shoot somebody and they just fall over and, you know, that's it. I mean, you know, you, you, you shoot them and sometimes you don't even know if you hit them. I mean, you know, and next thing you know, you get over to their body and you've shot them 15, 12, 15 times. I mean, the body's an incredible thing, you know. And the, the only thing that, I, that, that, that I'd ever, you know, the only thing that really will stop them like it does in the movies is a 50 cal. And, you know, I mean, I mean, it's just, it's weird. So, you know, you, you don't know, you know, you, I wasn't trying to, you know, well, I got that one, that you know, I mean, you're just trying to just stop them, just trying to get them away from you and, and try to focus on getting your team out, and that, that was really it, you know. So who, I have no idea. I mean, I, I tell you this, I didn't kill enough and I didn't save enough because if I had, I had killed enough, then the war would have been over, and if I had saved enough, none of my teammates would have died. At what point did it start to turn in your favor enough that you felt like you were going to be able to accomplish your objective and, and getting your guys never never I mean we were st I was still getting we were still getting shot at as I was leaving with my teammates bodies out of that valley and so it was never it never turned the, the tables I don't feel like the tide ever turned do you wonder sometimes how you made it out yeah yeah I think about that all the time you know I wonder why I wonder that it's not really how, it's just why. Mm. That's more of the question. So, does, based on what you've told me, does that mean that support did not come? Support ended up coming after we named, after we said, you know, two, two helicopters got there, but once, once we, I came over the radio, or we came over the radio, I don't know who did it, I, I thought that I was, but, uh, and said that we got four U.S. missing. That stacks up assets for days. When you say those words over the radio and a commander hears that, I mean, it's like everything focuses there, you know what I mean? That's the focus. we got to get those people back. And so we had, I mean, at one point in time, I know we had um, four Kiowa helicopters on station. We had two Apaches, and then we had two fast movers, which are airplanes, uh, that were dropping ordnance at, and then pararescue guys. Any idea how many hours th this took to unfold? That you know, time? I don't know. I mean... It, it, it seemed pretty quick, but I mean, you know, it was six, six to eight at least. I, I do remember, the only thing I really remember is getting back to the base about one o'clock, one, one thirty, and going to get lunch. That's what you did first? Yeah. Yeah, I put my teammates in a body bag, and um, me and me and Sergeant Bocas, uh, so um, whenever I got the last two guys out, or la when we got the four guys out, the first two left in with an Afghan vehicle, and then the last two were in a vehicle. And I said that I was going to go back and make sure that they made it back. And um, so I jumped in the vehicle with, and I had an Afghan driving and my interpreter. And we left the patrol and everything by ourselves and went all the way back to base. And when I got back over there, <clears throat> the Army Sergeant Major came up and said, I, was, I asked them where the freezers were. And so the Army Sergeant Major came up and he said, um, you know, hey Dakota, or Sergeant Meyer, you know, we'll let, we got people here that do this and, you know, they can, they can take care of it. And I said, you tell your people that they better not touch my Marines. And so I said that they're my guys and I'll finish it. And so me and Sergeant Bocas put all of them in body bags inside the, and we put them one by one in the, um, in the freezers. And then after we got them in the freezers, we had to go back through all of their, you know, and, and get all their belongings out and stuff like that. And then, you know, we put the flags over their, over their body bags and put them on the helicopters with the pararescue guys. 
and they took them back to Bagram. And then after that, I walked back to, uh, walked, talked to that Sergeant Major for a little bit. Me and him talked, he asked what happened. And then, um, and then I went over to the, went to wash my hands and went to the chow hall and got something to eat. Now after something like this, is there a portion of time where they pull you out of? You know, they, your, they, your, your they, they were going to, and they had talked about it. They wanted me to stay on that base for two weeks. Do they call it decompress? And um, that was on Tuesday. Wednesday night, I went back to my base up. With, I, I got two guys to go with me. I called my Afghans and the Army guys who were up on our base and asked them to come get me, and they did. <clears throat> they came down. We got up there. Uh, as soon as we got up there, at next got there Thursday morning. Um, first thing I did is packed all my teammates' stuff up in our room, and then put all their stuff up to send back home to their families. And uh, then this September, it's the eighth, ninth, tenth, September, tenth or eleventh. I got in another gunfight. It was so I was already back in the fight four days later. What sort of wounds did you suffer? I took, I took shrapnel to my right arm, a little piece of it, nothing big, you know, stuff like that. So it didn't take you out of circulation then? No, I didn't know. So how long did you remain in theater there after that? Uh, so it happened September 8th. I arrived back home on December 5th, 2009. Was that the regular end of your no, They sent me home early. Said that I was wound too tight. I don't know why. Is that the last time you were there? Uh, no. So that was the last time I was there for as combat. I went back and I spent Christmas in Afghanistan last year. What was it like to be back? Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I've always wanted to go back. I never wanted to get out of the Marine Corps. I wanted to go fight. But, you know, with, for some reason with this Medal of Honor, they, uh, they're not really keen on that. So... What was it like being back? You know, it was, a, it was a harsh reminder of, you know, as soon as we landed there that night on on December 24th of 2013, you know, we had to do um, um, a guy named Sergeant, Sergeant V is his name. Um, so a, a sergeant had gotten killed that day, had a wife and kids, and so we had to do the ramp ceremony for him at night. So it was a... It was a harsh reminder of what, you know, what this place is, you know. It's a bad place. When did you learn that you were either being considered or were going to receive the Medal of Honor? You know, the rumors had gone around for a while. I mean, I didn't care anything about it. I still don't. I, that's why I don't wear it. You know, it's not, I'm not a Medal of Honor recipient. I'm a United States Marine that received the Medal of Honor. Um, it's something that... Um, it's no different than a Purple Heart that I was awarded. It's no different than a, you know, all the other medals that I was awarded. Um, you know what? It's not something that defines me. Um, you know what defines me is being a United States Marine. Take me to that day at the White House. Obviously, it's a moment where you're in the center of attention. But as you just explained, it's an honor that you don't see any differently than other things like the Purple Heart and so forth. So how did those conflicting emotions play out that day? Well, you know, you talked about it first in the interview. You talked about, well, what, you know, do you ever ask yourself why? Well, you know, I, same thing with the medal. You know, I feel like, you know, because in the military we live by the words. You, get, you either get them out alive or you die trying. And if you didn't die trying, well, you didn't try hard enough. And then you also live by the words, leave no man behind. So, you know, every time I put that medal around my neck, it's like, here, this is the, this is the medal that's going to show America that you're a failure. And, you know, everyone wants to know an interview about the worst day of your life. You know, nobody knows about Dakota Meyer. Nobody asks, you know, Dakota how he's doing. Nobody asks, you know, what do you got going on in your life? Everybody wants an interview of the worst day of your life to remind you that you're a failure. And it's just like I told... So I told the Marine that came and told me that I was receiving the medal, I said, you know, you think I'm a hero, then why don't you go tell my teammates that? The fact that you did bring them out, though, does that... Yeah, but, I mean, you tell them. They're dead. Yeah. What good did that do? You know, you send them home to their families, but, you know, didn't save them. Why? You know, I mean, there's 
all those questions, but you know that, that's why the you know the metal is such a. I mean, in my mind, to me, I mean, the metal is just you know the metal has done nothing but ruin my life. Because you can never get past it. You can never move on. You can never, you know, you can never try to go and do other things in your life to get past that point. You, you know, it's just caused another avalanche of bad stuff and made you remind. It made it remind you every day. What are you doing now? Uh, you know, so I run a construction company. Uh, we do a lot of general construction around the nation. Um, do a lot of consulting. I uh, help uh, do an initiative called uh, Trying to Make a Difference for All Veterans. You know, we got, I work with Toyota and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce on a uh, program called Hiring Our Heroes. So, you know, the unemployment rate for veterans returning right now under 25 is over 20%. So we're trying to help fix that problem. You know, we got 1.5 million returning veterans over the next uh, over the next five years. So we're trying to head that on and help them with their transition and, and achieve employment, employment to, you know, help them do what they, what they deserve, get what they deserve. What kind of progress are you seeing with that? Uh, it's good. I mean, it's just a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. You know, we've done good. We've done a, you know, the overall unemployment rate dropped a little bit this year for veterans overall. So, you know, we're trying to just head it on and do better. There's a lot more work to be done. We're nearly done, the United States is, with uh, major combat operations in Afghanistan. Given where we are, what, what are your thoughts on, on not only your time, but uh, what was accomplished there? Um, what was accomplished there? You know, we, we went over there to set them up. That's why it's called Operation Enduring Freedom. Our mission to go over there was to set those people up to give them the best opportunity that they ever had to succeed. And I'll tell you what, you know, I would never let anyone tell me that we didn't succeed at that. We, when we left, we left at a better place. When we left, their country was more stable than it was when we went there. So, you know, all these people who want to talk about, you know, well, the war was for nothing or it was this or this, you know, I, I'll never hang my head low for the actions that we did over there. We went over there and we gave our best. We gave everything that we had for this nation. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate that the nation is and Americans see it the way that they do. Last question before we let you go. Since all of this happened, have you been back in touch with that Marine recruiter? And if so, how did that kind of No, I haven't. Go? haven't. I haven't talked to him, you know, so. What would you say to him? I made it. Dakota, thank you very much for your service. Thank you for being here today. No, thank you so much. U.S. Marine Corps veteran Dakota Meyer. He served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and for actions on September 8, 2009, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. I'm Greg Corumbus, and this is Veterans Chronicles. Hi, this is Greg Corumbus, and thanks for listening to Veterans Chronicles, a presentation of the American Veterans Center. For more information, please visit AmericanVeteransCenter.org. You can also follow the American Veterans Center on Facebook and on Twitter, where at AVC Update. Subscribe to the American Veterans Center YouTube channel for full oral histories and special features. And of course, please subscribe to the Veterans Chronicles podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and please join us next time for Veterans Chronicles.